Hi, Dom. Thank you for joining me on the podcast. How are you doing? Very good, thank you. How are you doing? All right, thank you. So, as we can see, you're in the studio at the minute. Uh, what are you working on at the moment? Um, I've got a few things. I've got um, a f- four mixes that are kind of done. Um, so there's two that I sent off on Friday. I'm just waiting for people to tell me today whether they're, you know, what changes they want to get done. Um, and then I'm doing a mix of someone at the Royal Albert Hall. So that was a big live thing, which I've just got the video for. So when you sort of do that, a mix without the video of a live thing, you kind of, you get it sounding as good as you want, as good as it can get it. And then you get the video and then you realize like, oh, the cameraman really focused on like the saxophone player at that moment. But the saxophone's a bit tucked down in the mix there. So I've got to boost it. Otherwise, it's kind of a little bit of a mismatch between what you're watching and what you're hearing. So I've got I've done a bit of that. I need to do a bit more of that today or just go through and watch the video and make sure when you're seeing things, you can hear it clearly at the same time. So a bit of that stuff. And um, I've got some piano got played on a, and something I'm producing at the moment. And uh, I've just got to download that today and, and see how that's how that's working with the track. So loads of bits today, loads of little bits, which is cool. Keeps it yeah, keep yourself busy. Mm, mm, absolutely. You mentioned there, like, uh, you've done mixes, you've sent off. Is there any time where you think, like, you can overmix, where you do it too much, when it should be finished at a certain point? Mm, that's interesting. I don't think I've... That's a good one. I'm not sure you can tell from inside if you've overmixed. Do you know what I mean? I think you've always got it to a point where you feel that's right. Um, and then it might be that some the 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 artist or producer or whatever says, actually, we need it a bit bit looser, a bit raw, a bit more like the demo or something like that. And then and then so the overmix call will have come from someone someone else. I don't think you'd you'd ever well, certainly I, I wouldn't have done that myself, that oh no, I've done more than I should have here, because I'll always I'll get to a point where I'm like this is right and I can't hear anything wrong therefore it's done sort of thing and there's nothing that I want to fix or change or and and it's all moving in the right way the audience is hearing the right things at the right time because the focus being shift around with the dynamics of the mix so um yeah those are the sort of things that I I sort of listen for to decide whether it's done um from my point of view and then and then I send it off and see you know see how that compares to what they were looking for um, but yeah, I think as some, if something's been been overmixed, and I think that's that's something I would have to be told rather than um, rather than I would spot it myself because I would just think sounds good, sounds done. Yeah, I get what you're saying. So if a band or artist gets in touch with you now to want to work with you, have they got to excite you? Have they got to stand out? Like, how do you choose who you're going to work with? You know what it is is um, I've got a. I've got to feel like what I do will make what they've given me better. So, so my involvement will make the whole thing better. Um, so I've got to kind of feel like I've got a handle on what they're reaching for. Um, so if I understand that and know how to get it for them, then, um, then, then, then I'll be up for it because I think, you know, as long as I've got the time, then, then that's the sort of thing that I think, well, if, you know, if me, if me being involved in it makes it better then it's worth, worth me being involved. So that's kind of, there's no real kind of musical rules or anything like that. Um, I think people tend, they see my CV, you know, people that I've worked with and they tend to come to me with stuff that's kind of appropriate already because they've seen the other stuff that I've done, you know, so, uh, but I have thankfully got reasonably wide CV, so I do get stuff. I get solo singers, singer songwriters, bands. I do get a, a range, and and even orchestral things and stuff like that. So I do get a bit of a range uh, because I've done some pop and jazz and and indie and and rock and stuff. I have done a little bit around all of that, and I think really for me the main uh, sort of theme for what I do. And this takes a while. It's hard to work this out for yourself, I think. But I sort of think I do organic sounding pop stuff, pop in the loosest sense of the term, not like a kind of the Saturdays or like a really defined kind of girl bandy, boy band sort of pop, but just pop music that might include, um, you know, Ed Sheeran would be pop, you know, or, um, you know, singer song uh, would be, you know, I would count bands like Eurythmics from the 80s were a pop band, even though it was like two people wrote their own songs, did their own thing uh that was still very much pop so um i don't know why eurythmics came up as a reference <laughs> <laughs> that's popped into my head annie lennox for some reason popped into my head 
Um, yeah, so uh, I've completely forgotten what was the question. It like, um, how do this, like, is a band got to stand out and excite your feet? Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's got to, yeah. I got to feel like it's it's something that I can contribute to, and and you know, there, there will probably would have to be musically something that got me that made me think this is cool. I can do this with it, and this with it, and this with it, and then that will make it better, and that that will be yeah. So that would probably be. It's not like a rule that I have to think is you know, um, I have to get an adrenaline rush from hearing it, but there's that's probably kind of tied into me feeling like there's something that I can do with it that will make it better. If the band or artist does come in the studio, what's the, is there got to be a relationship there? Have you got to be on the same page and stuff? Yeah, I mean, I don't really get many people in the studio, to be honest. It's pretty rare these days because I'm mostly mixing. It's probably 80 90% of my time I'm mixing. So, um, and that won't necessarily be people in the country, you know, it could be anyone from all over the world. So, um, and even if they're in the country, they don't always come down because they don't need to. You know, we can do it all remotely and stuff. So, um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, even without that sort of one-on-one, -on -one, I think it is really useful to have some sort of relationship. I'll try and do a like a video call if if I don't know the person this is the first time. I'll try and do a Zoom call at some point, pretty early on if I can, just to chat about it. And and then you start getting a relationship, start understanding each other, and and that means that because if you're working with somebody in any creative project, there's always going to be things that come up where. Um, you know, you, you might disagree on something or, you know, I've done something, I don't want to call it a disagreement. I've done something in the mix that they want, they would had a vision of something else. So they need to tell me, we don't like that. Can you do something else? And I need them to know that I'm fine with that. You know, you can't offend me by saying that you had a different vision for the mix than, than not what I did. Um, and I think that's easier if you've had a like sort of one-on-one -on -one chat or even, you know, just a video call, um, they kind of can get the impression that I'm not like some sort of, some guy who's going to get massively offended and strop off or anything like that. You know, it's fine. I'm here to do the mix and do it how you want it. So, so that's all good. So, uh, yeah, I think that that is important. Um, whether you're in the studio with them or not, you know, if you're working with people, the better your, your personal relationship, the easier any kind of creative sort of working environment goes. Yeah. So let's go back to the start. How did you get into producing and mixing? Well, I was doing it, um, I was like a, in a band as a teenager and I'm very old, so this was the 90s. Um, and we had that thing where you have like a cassette boombox thing and you hit play and record and had like a microphone on the front and that's how we recorded ourselves. So it obviously sounded dreadful. I mean, we were dreadful, so that didn't help, but it sounded dreadful. Yeah. Too. So I bought a cassette four track because that was a height of technology at the time um, for home recording. So I bought that. And quite enjoyed that and then uh, that sort of upgraded that to an eight track and got a little effects machine and some synths and things and and i much preferred that bit really than the being in a band bit the being a band bit was kind of fun with my mates but but you know playing on stage and stuff that didn't really do much for me but but actually getting sounds and getting things to sound good i really enjoyed so um i got this is also pre-internet so i got a book out of the library on jobs in the music industry and found this studio engineer on you know as one of the jobs in the that that you could do it's like well that's that's what I like doing. So I um I got a list of studios. There was somebody my dad knew who worked in TV and he gave me the advice that again, this is a 90s thing, but uh any studio with an SSL or a Neve desk is gonna be a decent studio. So I got a list of studios in London, because I lived about half an hour in London at the time, a list of studios in London that had an SSL or a Neve. And I spent three or four days just going around knocking on the doors of all of those studios and saying, um, if you let me in, I work for nothing. I make really good tea. Um, and they all said no. And so then I went to Birmingham, the next biggest city, and did the same thing. And somebody went, yeah, I'll right, see you Monday. So um, I got work experience at this place in Birmingham that had an SSL. Um, and then what happened was that the guy that was working there, um, it was like a one room facility. Um, so I was kind of helping this guy out. I'm just trying to be you know, as useful as I could without really knowing much, you know, um, but would still make him a cup of tea at midnight if he was still there. So, you know, just being helpful. And then a job came up at UB40 studio and they had a bigger place, two rooms and, a, you know, a few assistants and stuff and assistant jobs came up. So he knew the chief engineer there, a guy called Mike Exeter. So he recommended me for that gig and Mike, Mike gave me the job. So that was my first job. So that was my first kind of in. And I was there for a couple of years and then I moved down to London and got a job at, metropolis studios 
uh, which is quite a big one. I had five rooms, a bunch of mastering rooms, programming rooms, all sorts. So that's, that was the biggest independent studio in Europe at the time, and maybe still is, I don't know. But um, yeah, that was a good place. And I was there for about seven years from bottom of the rung assistant to to um, the top of the rung assistant stroke in-house engineer, and then and then left to go freelance um, when I started getting a bit more work that was more for engineering and, and also with some Americans. And I was getting other work outside of just the fact that I was working at the studio. So it was time to go. And then I've been freelance since. What was it that kept you motivated when you were getting rejected in those very early days? Do you know what? Here's a weird story. Um, so that I was, I was 20, 20 at that point. Was I 20? Yeah, I was 20. Um, and so I'd left school and then I did a, a door to door sales job in between school and, uh, and that, and uh, and it was like commission only door to door sales, um, yeah. And it was it was brilliant. It was actually quite a lot of fun. It sounds brutal, but it was quite a lot of fun. Loads of people my age. We all lived in the house together. Went out a lot. It was really good laugh. Um, but you just get used to people saying no, and you just don't care. So so I I just I'd spent like eighteen months doing this job where just you know you go up and you know you make some sales, but most people just go no. And then you go, all right, then I mean, you move on, you, you do your best, they say no, and then you move on to the next and you find somebody that will say yes. So I was really used to that. It was fine. So I just would walk around all these studios, I'd do my best sort of thing, and they go, no. Nah. I go, all right, then, and then just go and find the next one. And <laughs> with the sort of hope that at some point I would hit a studio that went, yeah, right then. And, and eventually I did. Uh so yeah, it was that actually. That was what that was what uh meant I was able to do it. I think if I hadn't done that door to door sales thing, I think I would have found it a bit crushing to have spent so long with everyone just saying no and just thought this isn't going to work. But there was just a sort of uh an inbuilt positivity and um and uh, ability to take a no or a lot of no's without it kind of um without it worrying me. And actually I did I did hear recently there's a quote um from I think it was Churchill who said um it's something along the lines of success is um, is moving from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm or something. It's something along those lines, which is which is true. It's just like keep on going, you know, and eventually, you know, you, you get what you're looking for. But uh, but it's the thing that sets you apart from the rest. Normally, the rest of the crowd is the fact you kept showing up when it was harder and harder and harder, and you kept showing up, and then you got better and better because you were still doing it while everyone else had given up. So, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That's what got me through door to door sales. <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. What you studied music at uh, AS level? How, yes. Now, how did you? Well, you've done some research. That's right. <laughs> how, how much can a person learn from somebody else, music-wise, and how much have you got to take it into your own hands and do it yourself and make mistakes and learn from that? Yeah, I, I think it's it's always a balance, right? Because I think um, you know you learn a lot from the mistakes that you make, but you can also learn a lot from. For the mistakes other people have made you know so if you can if you can balance it between taking advice and um and picking up from other people as well as hammering it away yourself it's quicker if you do it if you do both you know i think that's the the, the optimum is to get get education get training and put it into practice as much as you can that particular qualification actually had one really interesting useful point uh this came up yesterday actually i was chatting to someone about this yesterday um so AS level music then they didn't they didn't do music tech that wasn't an option back then and actually the year I left school they they then started a music tech AS level which annoyed me because I could have taught it I knew it better than one of my teachers at that point <laughs> anyway didn't get that opportunity so it was proper music one so we studied a bunch of pieces by classical composers and stuff and one of the pieces we studied was um something called uh, lacrime which was also called flow my tears it had two titles um, I think Lacrimae might be the Latin for flow in my tears. I can't quite remember. By uh, somebody called John Dowland, who was a 14th century uh, lute player, kind of the first singer-songwriter almost, because he, he wrote all of his own stuff. And back in those days, it was all about covering other people's songs and doing versions of other people's songs. But he always did his own material, and he performed it himself with his lute, as I sometimes describe it as like Ed Sheeran, but good. And, <laughs> and, and then scroll on, years and years later, I'm working at Metropolis on um, on a lute session 
Uh, well, it was Sting. Sting did a loot album, right? He did a loot album years back. And and it was something to do with that. And this song was was one of the tracks because John Dowland was the, the most famous uh, loot player after now Sting. Um, so there was this John Dowland track and and it was the title was, you know, Flow My Tears or whatever. And I said, I was this lacrimate because that's the one that I knew it better as. And he was like, yeah. And it was a bit like, how does this 26 year old know the Latin title to the to the loot track that we're doing. And I think, um, and my mate was Sting's engineer um, and still isn't. Um, and, and he said, Sting was actually quite, you know, quite impressed that that I'd known a bit about the, the history of that sort of music. So the first I got, then, um, my mate Donal was going over to Sting's place in Tuscany to work on the the reunion for the police. You know, the police did that reunion tour a few years back and um, and it was to work on that. And he he needed another pair of hands on Pro Tools, basically. So he called me up and said, do you, do you want to come out and do this for six weeks? So uh, that 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 AS level learning about John Dowland meant that Donald had the confidence to ask me if I could go to, because he knew Sting thought I was all right, and, and go and um, go and do my first freelance gig, which was six weeks in Tuscany. So, so that was a weird kind of, useful thing that I learned out of that AS level music that one little bit did actually help my career it was good <laughs> yeah that's crazy that, that little uh, link there just helped yeah. boost your career yeah yeah um, yeah yeah very weird you mentioned you were in a band but you preferred like the production side you did actually release your own music uh, how did that come about uh, that was that was about five years ago I think um I can't actually remember what the idea I, th- I suppose I've always had ideas about and I've, um, I mean, now I've got like three or four tracks. I'm like, maybe I should finish these off. And I just never kind of, I'm always working on everyone else's stuff, uh, which is fine. You know, I like that. And that's my job. So <laughs> the other, I don't get paid to work on my own stuff. So, and also, you know, when you've sort of done a full day of like, you know, if you've done 12 hours of working on music, I find I kind of want to watch a movie or do, or, or see my kids or do something different, you know, with the day, then do some more music for me. Um, so I don't know why I actually managed to get to the end of that one. I think, I think I was just, I had a bit of time um, and also I got a few people involved. I sort of, I, um, uh, I sort of collaborated with some people. So, so Becky, who's Saint Saviour, um, sang on one of the tracks and there's just a few people that I was sort of friends with and working with a bit at the time that, that sang on them. So that kind of sped me up really. And also gave me an impetus to finish because someone else had contributed to it. So I felt I kind of owed them that, you know, that it got done. So, um, so yeah, so yeah, just put an EP out, um, and uh yeah it was it was interesting because i was i think the, another motivation was it's very electronic right well you can see i'm sort of i'm quite into synths um <laughs> and uh and i was getting a lot of work that was electronic which is fine i was getting a lot of acoustic stuff which i love and you know i think i'm quite good at um and then i put out an electronic ep and then i got a bit of work after that that was people that were trying to do a combination of the two so i thought oh well, that's quite interesting that's obviously had a bit of an effect that people have seen that aspect of what i'm able to do and gone oh well he might be the guy for us because we want to do this acoustic thing and i can see from his cv with you know sting and stuff on it that he can do that but also i can hear from his ep that he gets the electronic side and synth side too so um i think perhaps that that might have been a, a part of the motivation was just to show a uh, from my own point of view, a, a, a greater wealth of uh, sort of abilities and and being able to do things um, that are more electronic and synthy. Were you still like writing music and playing music like when you was uh, working in the studio all them years back? Um, a bit. So I had um, again, you, you get no time when you, you if you work for a studio, particularly one of those kind of high level ones like Metropolis or you know Abbey Road and all those kind of places. You really, particularly then, actually, I think they're a bit more sensible now. But then it was, you know, a hundred hour week wouldn't be unusual. The the amount of hours that you would do, it was so intense um, that you don't really get any time to do. You know, you see your 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 girlfriend, wife, whatever, um, and friends occasionally, and and apart from that, you were just working all the time. So I didn't get a lot of time. I did a few tracks with a mate who was a DJ, um, which um, never really got again we didn't didn't really finish them because he never had you know any time to do it and quite often what i'd do is because i was you know ambitious and wanting to get better at what i was doing if i had a bit of downtime i might get a band in and record them and mix them just to practice doing bands which is you know doing a full band recording a drum kit all of that sort of stuff 
um, is a bit more complex than than dealing putting six samples together, you know, to make a house track. So and 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 more what I wanted to do. So that's in my spare time, I would more be doing that than working on my own track. So I didn't really get much in, in that way done. I sort of dabbled in it, but again, I never really finished much. Didn't really get much time. You mentioned there uh, the hours were like grueling back then working in a studio. Mm -hmm. uh, is that better though? Like when you're single, you've got no kids, like no responsibilities as such. But then when you're older, is that why you wanted to do more freelance work? It's part of it, actually. The, the desire to go freelance is more to have more control over your time. It's not even to work less. Um, it's to have more control over your time. And also studios pay minimum wage, basically. They pay very, very low. So so you get a couple of days of engineering. That's the equivalent of about a week of assisting um, or, or or even more. So, um, so there's the combination of the fact that Metropolis don't actually have, or when I was there, I don't know what the deal is now. When I was there, they didn't actually have a role as an in-house engineer you were still having to assist on sessions at minimum wage for often by that stage assisting people who i thought i know how to do this better than you do this is ridiculous uh, so that sort of stuff winds you up when you're doing that you know you're better than them at it and you'll get minimum wage to sit there for 14 hours and watch somebody make a mess of it so um so that kind of you, you get a bit tired of that sort of thing so you kind of have to you have to leave and um and go out on your own so so it, yeah yeah it wasn't so much to it was more to get the the control over time because other you know as another example there was um because you you work for them and and not the not the fault of the studio manager but just things can come in quite quickly and quite randomly so you could have had a whole weekend planned um of stuff you might have bought tickets to see a band or whatever and at six o'clock on a friday it's like oh okay X band are coming in at the weekend and you need to do it because it's your turn because somebody else did it last weekend. And that's it. That's, you know, and it might be they're coming in in three hours and it's going to be tonight and tomorrow night and the night after. And and that's it. You're done. You know, so that and you're doing that. Um, so that sort of stuff is uh, you can only do so many years of that. And you're just like, I need it's not that I don't I want to work less. I want to work more, but I want to have a little bit of control of like, actually not today. Today, it's my birthday and I want to go and see all the friends that have come out to see me for my birthday. And I've missed one of those before. Like everyone came out to see me for my birthday and I couldn't go because like something came in and that was it. I was doing that. So yeah, yeah, kind of mad. Yeah, it's understandable that you want to take in your own hands kind of thing. Yeah, uh, be. You yeah. may I mean, I was lucky that my wife worked in the city uh, and she still does. She works in finance. So she worked in the city. So she was often doing very long hours as well. So I think that made it a lot easier for me for other people where, you know, their wife, uh, finishes work at five o'clock and you finish work at two in the morning and if those are your lives and that's kind of difficult to to match that up but because she was often working till 10 11 anyway um then it it didn't matter that much that my life involved a lot of that so so um i was fortunate in that respect i think other people struggled a bit more when when there was a big mismatch in lifestyles between them and their partner yeah you mentioned you got your break though uh working with ub40 as assistant um what was it like working on the album? It was cool, actually. So it's interesting. Um, I mean, there's eight of them, which makes it an interesting dynamic anyway. Any band that big um, is is kind of fun. But it's, it's kind of odd as well because they were um, they were my boss in terms of they owned the building, you know, it was their studio, as well as they were the band that we were working with uh, for... I did a couple of albums with them um it was labor love three and oh, what was the other one guns in the ghetto those two albums that i worked on um so so yeah they're, they're they're interesting nice people um good at what they did and um yeah 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 it was good fun and then you know it was a commercial studio so i worked with all sorts of other people you know while i was there as well um that that were you know either local or or it, it had a obviously Predictably, it had a good name for reggae. Um, it also had a good name for metal for some reason. Um, I think it just accidentally, Cradle of Filth made a couple of albums there, um, which is a black metal band, and then um, and then a band called Kill to This, and that all happened in a little small space. And then Tony Iommi lived down the road, so Tony Iommi from Black Sabbath worked there a little bit. So it got this sort of reputation for metal and reggae, which is kind of weird, but, uh, but you know, kept the work rolling in, so it was fine. Uh, Mike Exeter, who he was working as assistant for, uh, he mm -hmm. is, he produced like metal albums and heavy rock albums, doesn't he? Yeah, so he, um, I think one of the very first sessions I did there was Mike was the in, was the engineer, so he was chief engineer there, and he engineered this thing for Tony Iommi that I assisted him on, 
Um, and he's basically been Tony's engineer ever since. So like whatever that is, 25 years or something on. And so he has worked on S Sabbath stuff and also some Judas Priest and a bunch of other things, but 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 consistently been kind of Tony's guy ever since then. So yeah, yeah, he knows his guitars. <laughs> We've mentioned uh, Mike Exeter. Um, you worked with a lot of brilliant producers though, Phil Spector, Tony Visconti and uh, Mark Ronson. Did you learn a lot from these people? Oh God, yeah, 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 amazing. I mean, particularly, you know, people like um, Phil Spector has a very different way of working because he hadn't really, when I worked with him, it was on this Star Sailor record that he did, um, or at least he started. Um, and and he, I don't think he had been in a studio for, for 20 years or something at that point. I think he'd done a couple of tracks with somebody um yeah it, but so he had a very kind of old-fashioned way of doing it which was which was really interesting so here's a like like for one example so I was just the assistant on that um and a guy called Danton Supper was engineering um and Danton called him up and said uh to talk about the session said do you want any effects like on the desk so you can just you know have them ready set up and he said oh yeah yeah that'd be good and Danton says you know what you know what do you want what, what should I set up and he said oh the usual seven and a half and fifteen and he was talking about tape speeds. That's seven and a half inches per second, 15 inches per second. So it wasn't even reverbs or anything. It's just put me up seven and a half and 15. <laughs> so then I had to get a half inch machine, two half inch machines running at different times so that we could have these these effects running for him all the time. <laughs> it was good though, it was good fun. I mean, it was, a, you know, it was all on tape. That's probably the last thing that I did that was all on tape, I think. Um, and and yeah, it was he he ran it in an old school way. You know, he was he was in charge. He was the producer, and and uh, and people did what he told them to. He was nice though. He wasn't like obviously he had a dark side, which everybody now knows about. Um, but that wasn't apparent at all. You know, when I was working with the, you know, he sort of he turned up and he gave everybody a hug, and he was funny and you know and incredibly creative. And uh, yeah, so that, that was really interesting. And you know, Visconti interesting as well him and Visconti both came from a background of having been arrangers. So that was before they got into production that they, they, they had written scores and, you know, arranged orchestral things for people. So I found with both of them that it seemed like they, they worked in that way and that they had the different frequency spectrums in their heads and they needed to fill them in the right way. So they, they would, you know, just as they would be thinking when they're arranging, okay, we need some sort of flutes or, or something up here in this bit. Um, with a band, they'd work in a different way where it's like, oh, we need some high thing on the guitar or or play that an octave up on the Hammond or, or things like that. So they were putting that together when they're helping the band put the tracks together. They they had that kind of arranger head on, which is a, a, a different approach than anyone else I've seen um, making records. And obviously they were very successful, so maybe we should all be doing it. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned Phil Spector stuck to his old ways. Have you noticed, have you done that, like, all these years later, have you stuck, I know technology's changed a lot since the start, but have you stuck to your way, like, the same ways? That's a good question. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't really sort of analyse my process enough, I guess, to know if I've done that or not. Probably. I think you'd probably have to get somebody, like, maybe one of my students or someone to go, why does he still do that? Um, or, or people that I work with, you know, that, that, that wonder why I'm doing it the way I'm doing it. But, um but I, you know, I try and I try and um, just find the best route, really. And and I think I suppose sometimes I do things that might seem a bit old school. Uh, oh, so here's a good example. I still take paper recalls um, because I find that really quick, and I don't like. And the idea of like, oh, well, we just take a photo, but then the photo is on my screen here, and the gear is down here, <laughs> and trying to recall like seeing what I've done and then go over there is really annoying whereas if I've written it down on a piece of paper I just take that with me and then yeah. that's really cool. so yeah so maybe that's just because I've got too much gear but um but things like that I suppose are quite old school um and I don't I've, I've often thought about changing it but then any any other system is worse than than what I do at the moment so I'll just stick with that thanks um <laughs> uh but you know I use I use, I suppose, I use a fair amount of outboard. I, I, I still like that, but that's actually, I, I still feel like I'm here. So here's a good example. I can he, hearing the difference between them. So I've got, um, I don't know if you can see it here, the Millennia EQ, right, NSEQ2, which is the solid state and valve one, right. Um, and I was in the middle of a mix. I was almost done, and it broke. It just died. Wouldn't pass signal, right. So, so I had to kind of really, and and it was a mix where they'd. They'd already had it 
and I was making some changes. So I wasn't really in a position to, I didn't want to do anything big change wise. So, so I bought the plugin version. You know, there's a plugin version of one of those, right? Put the same settings on it because obviously it sat there with the settings on it. So match the settings and then listen to the mix with as it had been with the real deal and then and then with the plugin. And and EQ wise, it sounded identical. Like it was the same amount of top and the same sort of characters top and stuff like that. But the one with the real box just sounded a little bit more 3D, the whole mix, than the one that had just, just gone through the plugin. There was something about passing through those. I know that's kind of like the voodoo that everybody argues about, but I could hear a slight difference that was just a little bit better to my ears, the fact that it had gone through some real gear. Um, and and hence, I've still got quite a lot of outboard because I quite like loads of little bits of outboard adding up to giving you a more 3D kind of picture. That still works out quite well for me. Um, and that's kind of old school of me, I know. And a lot of people just don't bother anymore and just do everything with plugins. And that's fine. It just, for me, that gives a different, slightly different sound. Like if I wanted to do something really pop, I might just go plugins because it wants to be just like up front and really in your face. Whereas, but most of the stuff I do has an element of of width and depth required. Um, so the fact that there's some valve compressors and and, and EQs and stuff going on to help give it that, that extra dimension. I'm guessing after all your experience, you can hear things in like records that nobody else can really hear. Does that make sense? In theory. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> speaking of uh, producers you've worked with, uh, how did you come up about working with Mark Ronson? Uh, so that one was, um, that was just a random one, actually. So, yeah, quite a bit of serendipity. So the Visconti session I worked on, right? So the first time I worked with Tony was um, uh, Morrissey, right? Uh, it was an album called The Ringleader of the Tormentors, which he'd recorded in Italy, and then they needed to do the B-sides. So we did um, a bunch of recording in Studio A at Metropolis, then some vocals in Studio B, and then he wanted to mix it, but basically the record company would give him the budget to, him to go mix it in his own place back in New York. So we did some rough mixes, um, and and that was that. And then two months later, two or three months later, this session came in. It was like, oh, there's uh, Amy Winehouse. So I'd worked with Amy doing square word replacement for Frank. You know, so like, you know, Capital Radio, you can say damn, but you can't say shit or, so, you know, something like that. So we had a bunch of these things to do for, for the single. So I'd done a day with her, you know, whatever it was a couple of years previously. And then it was, oh, she's coming in and there's this New York DJ who's producing producing so i got that as an in-house engineer gig it was recorded i think it was recording bass or something or it was fairly simple and mark was doing his own album at the same time he was doing version uh, you know the the, uh, the covers album at the same time as doing back to black um so generally the sessions would be a bit mixed up in that there would be just stuff to do on or on all of it and i think it was like a billing nightmare for the studio managers like well half of that day was under this label but then the other half was under this label because they did a little bit of both records so um so i would just do you know just doing whatever but but what happened was um i don't know if it was the first day but it, it, whatever was first day went well so then i got asked to do a couple more sessions and stuff and then on one of those really early sessions um he had to go and dj and we were doing a song called stop me if you think you've heard this one before and that's a smith's tune that um that he uh, got this guy Daniel Daniel Merriweather, I think that was his name, to sing on, and and for Mark it was quite an important one because I mean it's it's quite a good gag that that's the first single off the covers album is "Stop Me If You Think You've Heard This One Before." So he, he kind of wanted that to be the first single, um, and then also he really wanted Morrissey to give it the okay, and I don't think he had to. I think the like the the publishing or whatever would say yes regardless of what Morrissey thought or something. Um, but he really wanted Morrissey to 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 agree to it. So um, so he had to go and DJ this night, and we'd just done the bass on it. So he said to me, can you do a rough mix um, so we can send it to Morrissey to get his agreement? By the way, Morrissey's never okay to cover before. Bye. And then went. <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh, great. But because three so i did a rough mix i only had i only had like two or three hours left and then you know it was a 12 hour day and i wasn't in a position to stop charging them loads of overtime because i wanted to do a rough mix so um so i only had a few hours and uh and what i just thought was well i remember from 
the Morrissey session, basically he had some weird vocal sound that he was really into. And Tony had sort of explained it to me and said, it's going to sound odd. Morrissey's really into this at the moment. So just, just, we're just going to do it. So like, yeah, obviously cool. So then I thought, well, why, why, why don't I use that weird vocal sound and, and mix this cover um, using that odd sound? And then, and then maybe Morris will be into it. And he was, and he loved it and said, yeah, that's great. You can do that. So, so then Mark was really pleased that I'd, I'd done a, you know, a rough mix that had been the first cover that, that, uh, that Morrissey had okayed. Um, and, and yeah. And so then I just worked with him a lot from then on. I was his engineer for two, two and a half years, maybe three years, something like that. He's London engineer. Cause he, he was in New York a lot, uh, working with a guy called Vaughan and, um, and I kind of covered all the London stuff. So, yeah. From that versions album, like, was it back to black after versions? It was on it. Uh, I don't know which one came out first, to be honest. I no, don't I know. Yeah, um, kind of. The same time on it. Then, because the Valerie was on that, and everyone thinks Valerie was on Back to Black. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yes. but uh, we, it's one of the biggest albums of the twenty first century. Back to Black. What was it like working on that album? That was great. So, so I was um, as he was all over doing various things. Um, I, I did the kind of the orchestral stuff, really. So I recorded the strings and the brass and the percussion. And then some, uh, you know, like I was saying, you know, some random bits, like a few bass parts, some some guitar bits, um, some backing vocals, and the lead vocal to He Can Only Hold Her. I recorded that one. Um, a lot of the drums and bass were done by um, the Dap Kings, wh who, which have their own place in, in Brooklyn. So that was all done there by those guys. And um, and then, you know, the, the the other instrumentation was done randomly around wherever Mark was. And then the orchestral stuff was done done with me in, in Metropolis. So so yeah, that was kind of my involvement on it. And it, it was it was great. And the thing is, I think the first day we did um, Strings on Rehab and Back to Black and, and they were obviously brilliant songs. But I don't think anyone who says they know that it's going to be a hit is lying because you don't because you work on loads of great stuff that just for whatever reason doesn't happen, you know, and, you know, there can be for for a hit to really work or for something to really hit there's got, everything's got to be on point you know everybody's got to be doing the the, the recording's got to be great the mix has got to be great the production's got to be great the performance has got to be great but also the a and r have got to be great and and the management have got to be great and the press people have got to be great and all of that's got to work so that everyone gets to hear the great record because if it's a brilliant record and no one hears it, it doesn't matter it's not going to be a hit it's got to be heard so so all of that's got to be in place um, in order for a really good, really good record to land. So, um, so I thought it was been. I thought she was stunningly good, just ridiculously good singer, um, mind blowing. Um, and Mark was obviously really good. You know, he was putting great tracks together and really an interesting way, and and all of that. So that was all great. You know, I was really enjoying it, but um, didn't know it was going to be one of the most important albums of the twenty first century so far. But um, but I'm glad it was. Lucky me. <laughs> it is a brilliant album, but the lyrics on the uh, album are about her relationship breaking up, depression, addiction. Was it hard for her to record the album and open up like that? So That's a good question. I don't know. She seemed fairly... She didn't seem too much in a dark place when she was working, but, you know, I didn't know her that well. She was a client, and she came in and out occasionally, and, and we chatted and stuff, but it wasn't like we were mates. Um so she seemed okay. Um, the, so the only one, as I said, the only vocal I recorded was He Can Only Hold Her. And actually, here's a good story about that one. Um, she was in a very good mood that day because a leopard print bedspread had just been delivered to her house before she left that morning. And she was very excited about her, lep her new leopard print bed. Um, and, and she even ad-libbed in between the first chorus and the second verse. She did this little, I've got a leopard print bed. I've got a leopard print bed. And, she was with herself. and, and Mark kept it in. So that's still in the song. If you listen to He Can Only Hold Her, you've got a little ad-lib of her singing about her leopard print bed, which is because that had arrived that day. So she was in a very good mood that day. Um, so, yeah, uh, I don't know. I, I, in my experience, I've found a lot of people that can be quite dark lyrically, um, sometimes exercise that quite well through their art and, and then in their personal lives that they're, they're less dark so for example i've worked quite a bit with richard ashcroft and worked a little bit with nick cave and they're both kind of seen as quite dark characters and you know and their, their lyrics can be quite heavy and stuff and they're both hilarious people very very funny so it's this sort of they get that bit of themselves out through that expression of art and then and then you know in their day-to-day -day lives they don't feel that so much perhaps i mean that's just my 
pop psychology version of it but um but yeah she didn't seem to be uh in too much of a dark place at that at the point of recording yeah yeah what can you remember finding out that you'd won a grammy for back to black <laughs> yeah i got a text from my mum because <laughs> it was on i had to work the next day down in sussex at, where i was working with a mate of mine and um and so because it's in la and that was one of the later awards it was something like five in the morning when that award was announced for us. So I didn't bother waking up. I didn't bother to set an alarm because I thought we we're not going to win anyway. So I'm going to ruin my drive, my, my my day by getting up at five and going, oh, didn't win. And then trying to get back to sleep, but just being annoyed. So um, so I didn't get up, but my mum did get up and and um, she set the alarm and then she saw it um, get announced. And so, yeah, I got a text from her saying, well done, you won. Um, so that, yeah, that was when I found out. Uh, text from my mum at about six in the morning <laughs> was it quite rewarding though because of all the time you've been rejected in the early days it gave you that like satisfaction yeah I guess I didn't uh, yeah I didn't really um frame it that way but yeah I suppose so it's sort of I mean it is it's like it's it's one of those things I was chatting to a mate of mine actually about this and he's a guy called Chris Potter I worked with him loads assisted him absolutely loads um and he um he worked with the Rolling Stones for a bit and did all of Richard Ashcroft stuff and 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 he said he found a similar thing. So so having an award like a you know like a Grammy or or for him he found when he had Rolling Stones on his CV, people make certain assumptions at that point. Like oh well if you've done that if you've got that you must be all right. You know it's like the Rolling Stones aren't going to work with just anybody. They they can work with anybody. And so if they've chosen you you must be all right. And I think it's the same with a Grammy. And to be fair I've got a few friends with Grammys. I don't know anyone with a Grammy who isn't good at what they do. I know a lot of people that are good at what they do that don't have one, but, and that's luck of the draw, you know, the projects that you ended up working on. Um, but everyone I know that's got one is, is pretty good at, it, at what they do. So um, I th think that's, that's what it does. And that was the advantage. So, so that sort of was quite nice that, you know, you got that kind of backup and it doesn't, I don't think it makes a huge difference, but it does kind of, it's a little bit of a, it's another kind of another thing to back up your CV. It's like he's done all these things and he's got a Grammy, so he must be all right. So I think that's it's been it's been good for that. Uh, but it wasn't a big. I suppose it was for a day. I felt pretty good. Um, when I got to the studio, they uh, the the producer bought me a cake and they made me a tambourine crown and and found some gold material somewhere for a cape. And so I was the hero for the day. But I just carried on working. I was mixing an EP for some people. Um, but yeah, 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 it's it's uh, yeah, it's fine, and and it means um, like uh, uh, a friend of mine won a Brit Award, and he said you have to change your name because from then on, you your your first name is the award winning or the Grammy award winning, and then your first name becomes your middle name. So I, <laughs> anything in the industry, you just the Grammy award winning Don Morley, and that has always got to be the first bit. But you know, can't complain. Could be worse. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Who? You also, we mentioned, worked on uh, Valerie on Mark Ronson's uh, version album. Did mm. you like when you think of Valerie now? You think of Amy before you think of the Zoo Zootons. Did you realize it was mm. that much of a big cover? Yeah, I think it, and I think that came about because she was listening to it at the time and loving it. Um, I think a story Mark told me was that he'd he'd asked her to be on the album, and she was like, "Oh yeah, well I've got there's this song that I've been listening to. Can can we do this one?" Um, but yeah, I mean, that was, that was a really effective one. And actually that's, that's in some ways been the most rewarding thing I've worked on, uh, because everywhere you go, no matter where you go in the world, if you're somewhere in a bar or something, Valerie gets played. And normally if Valerie gets played, people start dancing, like people who were sitting down all night. And I've seen this happen so many times, sit down all night, get up and dance to Valerie. And then they sit down again. And like that was the one song that I couldn't help themselves, and just so so. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of joy in in knowing that I've been part of something that gives other people that much that much joy. It's obviously a lot of people's uh, one of their favourite songs, so it's great. But yeah, she did she did an absolute storming version. Well, they did, you know, Mark and her did an amazing version of that, and and uh, and it was a great song anyway. You know, I've seen the Zootons live before, and they're a great band, and and um and it was a great song. But yeah, she managed to um, put it in a different place that made it made it work for more people which is cool i think covers could be like a bit of a tricky road to go down because if you don't make it your own it's just like you kind of just copying a song but she turned into a him her and uh, mark turned into their own thing didn't they yeah yeah absolutely yeah and it kind of it worked with the vibe of 
the record he was making you know that sound that he that he had and um and she was just you know ludicrously good singer so um that kind of work but yeah i've done quite a bit on that because but one of the albums i did for ub40 was labor of love three which is a covers album they did a lot of covers ub40 because that's quite a reggae thing um is to do covers to do versions of other people's songs that's quite a big tradition uh in that kind of world so um so that's kind of from from very early on i was used to that as being um uh uh, something normal to do in it uh, and uh, there's some some people have like a bit of a hang-up about covers I've, I've known people that have like oh i can't do a cover i've got to all do all original like it's got, all got to be me or like why who cares <laughs> even like like indie artists seem to be quite quite like that it's like you like jeff buckley right like three songs on his son grace are covers like it's fine to do covers it's like it's perfectly acceptable and if you do it in an interesting cool way then you've 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 added some art to the general the general world of art so uh yeah yeah i'm always up for a cover i think it's uh i think it's a good thing if you can do as you say if you can do something that's you you know with with their lyric and melody then um then you've you've added something you uh you worked with another brit a big british female artist in adele uh, on her debut album what was that like that was great so that was another ronson thing actually so he produced this track called cold shoulder um and so uh i did some time with them doing uh recording her vocal and and a bunch of other stuff i think there was um some horns and, and a hammond and uh yeah i think I'd, I'd been on holiday when they did the first bit so somebody else did half of it did like the drums and bass and guitar and then i did the all the rest of the overdubbing and the vocals and stuff afterwards so yeah it's great i mean it was her first album uh but she was brilliant you know and, and she is i mean obviously the rest is history kind of thing but she is uh she was great and she was lovely and yeah yeah all good all good you know, like it's not my kind of uh, music, and I don't really listen to Adele much. But she's obviously a big superstar. Did you know she was going to achieve what she did? Like, do you know that when they're doing the debut album? Nah, you don't. You you know they're good, but like I was saying before, you know they're good, but you don't know if they're going to get lucky with everything else. You know, if it's if it's going to work out. And particularly, we only did one song, so I had no idea what the rest of the record was going to be like. But she was on a good label, so that was a good start, and. Uh, she was working with a guy called Egg White, who was um, a writer who was doing a lot of good stuff at that point. So I'd seen him around and knew it was on XL. And so between those things, I thought, well, you know, she's in with a chance. And the song that we did, I thought was a great song. Um, so, and she was a great singer, you know, so she had a lot of stuff going for her, but um, but no, I don't think you can tell that she, she was going to be what she became. I think, you know, she had a lot of, uh, huge amount of talent and, and she's very good at, um, it seems she's very good at, at um, doing it on her own terms and making sure it's as good as she needs it to be, you know, which is why there's such big gaps between records. It's like, she's not going to do that, get an album out every two years, go on tour. She's going to make sure she waits until she's got something to say and could do something great. And that's fantastic. I mean, that helps if your first album is a big hit and then you've got the power and the money to just go, I'm not going to make a record for a little bit. I'm going to wait. Uh, not everybody gets that, but but she didn't mean she had to do it, and she did, and I think that was a great thing about her. So, um, so yeah, no, I didn't know, but I'm glad it was. You mentioned like some albums that you've worked on, you expect to be bigger than what they are, and the bigger ones sometimes that you don't think are as good. Is there any albums that you worked on that weren't big, uh, massive ones that you ex uh, that you like people that you'd suggest to people to listen to? Uh, yeah, so so here's a good one. There's a guy called um, Cy Connolly. Um, I did an album for Cy Connolly. Um, uh, it just, it's worth just looking at his work because all of his work's great. He's an incredible singer. Um, but but I did it. Me and and Chris Potter um, did his first record, um, and that was um, that was a while back. But there had some amazing songs on, and he was a brilliant performer. Um, but yeah, it's just check out his stuff because he's got so many so much good stuff, and he just hasn't really had enough luck yet um but you know hopefully it'll come he just keeps on putting out good stuff so hopefully at some point it'll it'll all explode but um but yeah he's definitely worth one worth checking out go look up oh, so yeah they'll definitely check you out i just want to talk about uh technology nowadays because you can make an album in your bedroom now with the technology that's around now uh do you think that'll have a good or bad impact on music and what do you think of ai do you think that'll ruin the future of music depending on how it's used. Uh, yeah, so that's, so that's, I was chatting recently to a, a mate of mine who's um, a script writer, a quite successful script writer and producer and stuff on TV. And um, we were talking about the impact of AI. And and I think 
what that's going to do, what AI is very good at, I mean, somebody, I heard somebody calls it a, a plagiarism machine, which is quite a good way of describing it, really, because all it does is it takes, it amasses a load of information from other stuff that's already out there and then sort of tries to find a way to make something sound a bit like that. Um, it's not very good at, at the, I guess, I don't know how you could say, a positive creativity or, or human creativity, the stuff that we like. Um, it will do something that's very similar to what you've already heard before. So I think um, in terms of music production and writing and all that sort of stuff, um, what it what it will be able to do very quickly is the ordinary. So if you want to, if you're making an ordinary sounding record, and if you make ordinary sounding records, or ordinary TV shows or ordinary stuff, AI will very quickly eat your job because it can do ordinary pretty well. It can do a bit like stuff you've you've heard or seen before. So what that does is that means that people in order to stay employed in this job, need to lean further into a more creative, more interesting area. And that's that's where we're going to be uh, needed and useful. And that's where the, the the career path leads, I think, into into more creative and more interesting. So so if you're a mix engineer, um, you want to work on making things sound interesting and just try and, try and edge interesting sounds into the things that you're doing. Uh, because that's where the future of people mixing is going to be. It's not in making it sound safe and normal and nice, because AI will soon be able to do that for you, um, and nobody can employ you to do that. But they'll employ you to do weird and interesting. Yeah, you mentioned um, before when I asked about uh, if you stick to the same stuff from what you've done years ago, if you stick to the same uh, ways of working, you mentioned that your students might say uh, that you do you work at Leeds Conservatoire. How did that job come about and do you enjoy it? Yeah, I haven't done it. I've, I've been on a bit of a hiatus for a while on that one just because I've been really, really busy. But yeah, I do. It's a great place. Um, I literally saw the, the advert and I'd I'd been, I'd felt like for, for a start, this is my, this is, this is where I work. This is me in, it's like a barn in a farm area. Um, so uh, I am on my own vast majority of my work in life and I'm, I'm naturally an introvert anyway so that kind of works for me but but it, it had got a bit much and I was starting to feel a bit odd about it and so I realized I needed to work into my life some form of speaking to people um into my working life and also I had been I had been wanting to do something educationally for a while because I you know I worked in these big studios and I learned off great people like Mike Exton and Chris Potter and people like that that were that were and Visconti and everybody I, and I felt very lucky to have learned off all of those people. And then it sort of felt a bit selfish to then just take all of that and sit in here on my own and just go, oh, haven't I been lucky learning all of this stuff off these great people now I'm going to use it without ever passing anything on myself and what I've learned of, from those people and from my own mistakes that I've made. Um, so I kind of wanted to do something educationally anyway. And um, and I did a few guest lectures and, and things like that around. around. And then this I saw this thing come up and... I'd always been kind of impressed with Leeds Conservatoire. And then um, it was um, a tutor for the MA, which kind of worked. It was a day a week in term time. So that all that kind of timing worked for me. So I went for that and got it, fortunately. And and yeah, I've really enjoyed it. It's, it's um, they've got, they got great people there. Um, and, and the students are always, you know, it's, it's really, it, it really challenges you. There's a great saying that if you really want to learn how to do something, teach someone else how to do it. Um, because you get asked questions about, I mean, a bit like you've been doing today, you get asked questions about your process and stuff like that, and you think, I haven't thought about that. I see, maybe I should. Maybe I should have an idea about how I do that and how I approach that and stuff. So um, all of that, all of that is really good um, for, just from a selfish point of view, you know, that I, 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 you know, get better at what I do because I'm teaching other people how to do it um, that are themselves pretty good anyway because they're our MA students, you know, they know what they're doing. So, um, so yeah, it's it's been really good. And it was just, it was literally... I wanted to do something educationally and then I can't even remember where I, this this ad just popped up in my life somehow and I saw it and thought oh yeah I'll go for that that looks like the right sort of gig. What could somebody who signed up for the course expect in, like to learn from it? What is it uh, so I can only talk about the MA because that's the only yeah, bit yeah. That, that I was involved in um, and I can actually only talk about my bit of the MA because that's the only bit I can really know but basically they, they do um, you had 10 hours of one-to-one -one, um uh, each each term so you had like an hour a week on a on a one-to-one -one basis with with um someone like me um 
And what I quite liked about it, what was quite cool, is you could kind of chop that between whatever you whatever you wanted to study. So someone might have five hours with me and five hours with a guitar person. So if they wanted to up their guitar game as well as up their recording, production, mixing game, then there will be like you can kind of split your one to ones around a little bit, and 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 then next term you can decide to do something different. You might decide to go all guitar next term, or and then all music tech, you know, for the final term or something like that. So you can really um kind of pick your own choose your own adventure as it were with uh how, how you want to how you want to put the ma together and 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 what you want to learn out of it so i think that's really um that's quite a cool way of doing it you're the founder of uh, the mixed consultancy how did that come about uh, that actually came about a little bit from what i noticed um it's, it's, it's several things all these things tend to come from like a bunch of different ideas all, all land at the same time and you go oh that might be useful um so a lot of what i was finding was uh the the people needed um on the m on the ma was they they kind of needed or what was really helpful was having me listen to this stuff and go have you noticed this this and this in your mix um that that, that could be better if you did a few little tweaks and they hadn't heard it they hadn't noticed that and then when they made the tweaks they went oh yeah that's much better and then the, the, and then they could sort of identify that issue from then on and could go on and do it themselves and and they got very quickly got very much better at mixing from me just being able to be a, a set of ears more you know 25 years extra experience of going these three things would make your mix much better and and actually that was way i learned um way back i did a session that was um it was uh, Chris Potter was producing it, uh, who was also an incredible mix engineer, but he was just producing this one. And then there were three engineers um, working on this session. And I was one of the assistants. This is one of my kind of later stage assisting gigs. Um, and it was basically, it's a big band who've made many, many, many records. Um, and they had all their, vi uh, sorry, all their vinyl, all their tapes, and they wanted it all digitized. So, and they also wanted a little rough mix of everything because they'd got loads of jams and songs that were half done, just wanted a rough mix of everything. So they could listen through and, and go, oh, that, that we forgot about that song. That's a great song. Let's do that on the next album, right? So, so the job was really load up the tape, put it into Pro Tools, do a rough mix of that song, put that on a CD. And, you know, and there was just a process that went on for a couple of months because there were lots of, lots of this stuff across three rooms at Metropolis. Now, the guy that I was assisting was ill for a couple of days, two or three days. And because I knew Chris quite well, he said, look, I tell you what, Dom, you fill in for Max and you do all the kind of transfers and get the mix kind of ready and then give me a shout. I'll come down. And I'll just finish it off. Right. And what was amazing about that is I got to do a mix as well as I could do. And then this guy who was far better than me came and did a few things and went, there you go. That's better. And it was much better. But I got to see what he'd done that was, you know, changing my mix, making a few changes. And so I sort of got the advantage of of, of getting in his head and seeing what, what that was. So really the idea of the mix consultancy is the ability to do that for people. So you send me your mix and I'll go, okay, here's five things that you can change that will make it better. The bottom end will be tighter if you do this. And, you know, the vocals will be sitting a bit more comfortably if you do this to the guitars and this to the piano and all that sort of stuff. And just things that I, I would do if I was sat in front of that mix right now. And then they can go make those changes and hear the difference and then so i do two i do like you can do a gold package which is just that and then the platinum package packages you send it back to me and then i go right from here these are some more changes that you can make where where we'll get some more dynamics and we'll get more action going on send that to them and then they send it back again and then there's a third round of right from here these are these are the much smaller changes that are worth doing that that will make the mix better um and i do find people you know some people use it as a one-off because they've got a single that they want to just make sure is right or you get some um sometimes it'll be an engineer because you know if you don't want me to tell anybody i don't tell anyone well i don't tell anyone and it's just sometimes people say oh well, i've worked with the mix consultancy i don't ever say because sometimes people might want it on the quiet but i do sometimes get engineers it's like this is quite an important client do you mind just you running this through the mix consultancy and just just giving your set of ears and a bit of feedback on it as a, as a sec, as sort of another head on it um but I do find people that use it a bit, you know, might do three or four songs across a record or or use it a lot. They they get much better at mixing really quickly. It's like it's like a sort of build your own mixing course uh, <laughs> without being any sort of course. But just if you keep using it, you know, you, each time, each mix, you'd learn something that you didn't hear before. And now you can hear it. So then the next mix, you know, to listen for that 
300 hertz in the guitars or something that that you hadn't really heard was a problem before but you didn't know why the track was so muddy um and so and so yeah you very quickly build a really good uh kind of mixing ability so it's quite rewarding like that because people will send me another mix you know that have used me a few times and i go this is really good <laughs> you've really got better um and then it's even more of a challenge for me it's like well what would I change from here? Not a lot, actually. So we're getting really into details already. You can you can still always do a few tweaks and, and get it better, but um, but it's quite exciting when the first mix they send you is as good as the last mix was six months ago. So yeah, it's good. I think that's great that you're using all your experience over the years to help people out, and you're not like putting the pressure on them, saying this might help, do it like this and stuff, and then they're sending it back and getting your approval. I think that's great. Yeah, yeah, it's a nice process. Yeah, yeah, people seem to enjoy it, which is cool. Um, so just to finish off, you've had a successful career. Uh, what three tips would you give to people that want to start out in the production side of things? That's a good question. Um, okay, so one is um, just consistency. Just keep working at it. It's like, well, we were saying something earlier about just, oh, yeah, when I was knocking on doors and just keep on going. Um, just keep practicing. It's all about practice and experience and and just practice and practice and practice. Do as much as you can, um, ideally for other people rather than just for yourself, because you get feedback from other people. If you're making your own songs and you've only got your head and, and, and your opinions and, and it's much more difficult and therefore you learn quicker. If you're getting opinions from other people and they're saying, oh, no, I wanted it a bit like this, then you have to find a way yourself of getting it like they've asked for. So that's one really good thing to do is to just keep working, work with other people as much as possible. Um, you never know which um, which is the important gig. Uh, so uh, I, I the, the analogy I use is um, in, in football, the, the person whose job it is to score goals, um, they might only spend two minutes on the ball in a whole game at most, but because they spend 88 minutes getting themselves in a position to score and running around like a madman the whole time, then those two minutes count because they've got themselves in the right position. When finally a good ball comes up from midfield, they're in the right position. And it's the same with you and your careers. Like you don't know which gig is going to work. When I was told I was doing you know, vocals with Amy, this New York DJ is producing. Normally when a DJ is producing, it doesn't bode well, you know, but because they normally don't know what they're doing. But Mark, fortunately, absolutely knew what he was doing. Um, but, but you know, I still put everything I could into that session. And that ended up being, I didn't know it, but that ended up being probably the most important day of engineering of my career because that, that set up a relationship with Mark, which ended up being the Grammy and Back to Black and Adele and all of that stuff on my CV. Um, so, yeah, you never know which the important gig is. So every single gig that you do, you have to put in 110% and just make sure that you're you're as good as you can be um and oh what could what could a third tip be uh yeah, yeah despite all of this that i'm surrounded by don't get tied down by the gear it's not that um it's not the gear it is your ears it is practice so as a good example when i was working at metropolis doing those first kind of getting a mate's band in and doing some downtime stuff and, and practicing and doing mixes they were awful uh, I, the, my mixes were terrible and I was surrounded by the best gear I was in like SSL all these great outboard incredible room sounded rubbish because because it wasn't the gear it was me and then and then now I can do something far far better with far less equipment and uh, and the only reason why I have a lot of equipment around me is it's quick for me it's I get to where I want to be faster if I have these these few bits of gear so uh, so that's why I do that so yeah don't get hung up on that um, if you're going to get any gear, just get stuff to listen to. Get good headphones, good 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 monitors. Make sure you can hear what you're doing. Um, but uh, but apart from that, you're uh, you're good to go. Just practice. Yeah, I'd say they're brilliant tips. And thank you for joining me on the podcast, Dom. It's been brilliant to speak to you. Thanks for having me. No worries. Thank you for coming on, and uh, see you again sometime. Yeah. Good luck with it. Thank you. See you in a bit. Cheers. <laughs>